The time is 12.30, so let's begin here. Uh, today we will continue with an introduction to R. We'll talk about um, R and regression. Um, and at 1.20 we will discuss uh, the assignment number four answers and also discuss the next assignment. Are there any questions before we begin here? Okay, so we left off on about page 11 in the notes. So as I mentioned last time, R is organized into packages. And all packages, in terms of what, in terms of R's terminology, is a collection of functions and also data sets that are all put together in this thing called a package. Um, now, by default, there are a number of packages that are already installed in R. In fact, we, we took a look at them. Um, let's just, as a review, if I go under help, HTML help, packages, if I page down to the end here, where you see packages in that particular library, these are all the packages that are installed by default. So, for example, if I come over here to stats, you will see all the particular functions that are available. So, for example, there's a function called ANOVA. And guess what that might do for you. Um, now, there's many, many other packages that are available. Uh, there's thousands. In fact, I think right now there's over 9,000 packages that are available. And basically what people need to obtain those, you go to CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, and you essentially download them, install them into R. So then at the top of this help web page for packages, you can see all the packages that I've actually installed, that I've actually downloaded on my computer. Now, these packages are user submitted, meaning you can actually write a package yourself, upload it to CRAN, and then anybody can download it. And so this has become a great way in statistics, this is the first time that essentially this, this happened, a great way to disseminate um, research uh, through this nice free mechanism. Uh, so, for example, I am the co-author on two packages myself. Uh, with respect to students, what often happens is a student will write a dissertation where they're using R to do the necessary computations, and they're probably going to write some functions on their own to implement their new methods that they develop. And what do they do? Well, they put these functions together into a package, and they upload it to CRAN so that they can disseminate their work that they have just done for their dissertation. That's a common way that students get involved with doing packages. Also, these packages then provide a way of reproducibility of research. You know, before R existed, you know, typically um, in order to re reproduce somebody's um, uh, research that might be in a journal, you had to kind of figure out how to program it yourself. Here, that's taken out of the equation, you could say, because now that's already been programmed, it's in R, and now you can actually implement it. And it's greatly simplified um, our lives and allowed us to forward the statistical science much quicker than what it was before. Okay, so, so let's talk about how to install one of these packages. Now, it's actually set up very simple. So you don't actually go to that, um, I'm sorry, I didn't even show you the website, excuse me. So here's CRAM. And if I come over here to packages, see there's 9,435 available packages on CRAN. And if I come down to table of available packages sorted by name, here's all the packages. So for example, if I want to search for Ben Group, that's one of the packages that I, uh, I am a co-author on. Uh, obviously with so many packages, it's hard to find, it can be hard to find which package is going to satisfy your needs. And one simple way to do that is, let's say, if I do a, a search here for um, group testing, my research area, what you're going to see is that there's actually four matches there because there are four packages dealing with group testing, including my own. That's how you can search quickly to find what you need. So how can we install one of these packages? So I come over here to R and click on Packages, Install Packages. And up will pop up a whole bunch of what says CRAN mirrors. 
What that basically means is all over the world, there's many, many uh, servers, computer servers out there that are mirrors of one another in terms of they contain all the R packages. So for example, if I come down here to the United States, I usually go to USA Iowa. This is a mirror that's stored at, at, at Iowa State. Um, the actual closest one is Kansas. Uh, that's at uh, University, University of Kansas. And since I'm a K-State graduate, I can't go there. And so if I go to the Iowa one, up will pop up all 9,400 and some packages that are available. And as you can imagine, it's going to have to be careful here and try to find whatever one you need. Let's see if I can find Bin Group. Where is it? Bin Group. There it is. Click on OK, and it downloads it to your computer and automatically installs everything. So that's all there is to it. Now, this will remain on your computer until you delete it, if you ever chose to do that. To actually now use functions that are inside this package, you have to issue the command library package equal bin group. Now, all the pack, all the functions, all the data sets that are in that are available to me. Without doing that, I wouldn't have access to it. And you, and for every R session that you start, so if I were to close out R and open up R again, I would need to still issue this command. I don't need to reinstall it. I just need to issue this command. Now, another way to find an R package that might be useful to you is there are what are called task views in, in, on CRAN, on their website. And basically what, what people have done is organize these packages by their application. So for example, I have some stuff that I'm doing regarding optimization. So I click on optimization, and then I have a whole bunch of packages that are available uh, and some descriptions of them regarding optimization. So again, task views are quite helpful. So are there any questions? Okay, let's move on then. Uh, we're on page 12 now. So let's say that you have a number of commands that you want to uh, issue at the R command prompt. Um, you know, let's say x gets 2 plus 2. Y gets X plus 2, and you got a whole bunch of commands there. Well, you don't want to have to type them every single time, one by one. Instead, what you like to do is put all these commands together into a program. So if you have a program, you need an editor for that program. R has a very limited programming editor built into it. To access it, click on File, New Script. Script is just another word that's often used in R to mean a program. In here, I can do x gets 2 plus 2, and I'm going to print x. To run this program, one thing that I can do is if I only run, want to run those lines in the program, I come up here, I highlight it, come up here to edit, run liner selection, and look what happens. I'll try that again. <coughs> All that code is transferred to my R console window. That's how you can run a program using the programming editor. This programming editor is not very good in comparison to what else is available out there. So for example, you'll notice that everything's in just simply black and white. There's no color coding of syntax. So we can do better. And our next discussion then is going to be on two program editors which are better and that are free. Now the first one is called TIN. TIN stands for this is not notepad. <laughs> um, this is the one that I use. Okay, uh, it's, it's put together by someone who's in Brazil. Um, other people use it, but the second program editor that I'm going to talk about, which is called RStudio, is a lot more prevalently used. Um, I will talk about, I, still, I think RStudio is inferior to this, um, uh, 
Um, but I will talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both. So this is what TIN looks like. I have a program already loaded into it. This is called uh, Appendix, Appendix Initial Examples R. Uh, this basically contains all the code that we've run um, in the notes so far. I just put it all together into an R program. Notice an R program has a .R extension to it. It can be lowercase or uppercase, it doesn't matter as long as you're using Windows. Uh, if you're using Linux, uh, of course, if you're familiar with Linux, Linux is um, uh, case sensitive. And so immediately you're going to see that you have different colors. So the, there's syntax highlight. And one thing I really like about TIN is that you can control the syntax highlight. So this is actually not the default. Um, so, for example, you'll notice here you see some stuff that has kind of a background to it. Well, that all corresponds to comments. The way that you start a comment in R, the first, le first thing in the line has to be a pound sign. So, if I just do this here, pound sign, this is a comment. And I changed the, the coloring so that it stands out better. But again, this is not the default. In my notes, I talk about how you can make those kinds of changes if you're interested. Um, and so how do you use uh, TINR? So I can come up here to my toolbar. And let me tell you something else. There are bugs in this software pro program. And this is a bug that we just came across. I try to ignore it and look upon its brighter or its better parts to the software package. But if I come up here to, oh, <laughs> well, this isn't going to help sell this to you. Uh, if I come up here to this, you see where my mouse is? Notice it has a little R icon. If I get there fast enough, I can open up R. <laughs> and this is a uh, a different version of R in terms of how it's laid out. So there are two different versions of R. There's an MDI, which stands for Multiple Display Interface, and then there's a SDI, which stands for Single Document Interface. The main thing that you just need to know is that this is SDI. We've been using um, MDI before. SDI basically is just the R console window. Um, if you wanted to, and it, as you'll see this as we go along, let's say if you have like a graph that you want to create in R, well, a, a separate window will appear outside of the R console window for that. Where if I was in MDI, everything is contained within there. A graphics window will be contained within there. It's not that big of a deal, but that's why it looks different. Um, so when you install TINR and run R for the first time, uh, this will actually install a particular package that allows you to interact between TINR and R. So don't be alarmed if you see some kind of package called TINR.com being installed. Um, and so, so how do I use this? Well, I can just come over here and highlight some code. Oops, this little, really, it's not that bad. Oh, let's just restart. This is ridiculous. Okay, close that out. Do note that I'm using an older version of TIN. Um, I need to install a newer version. It's just I like this version, and I just haven't got around to installing the new version. Okay, so let's say if I want to um, open up a, a, a program. Uh, one thing that I've done on my computer is uh, uh, everything that has a .R extension corresponds to TINR, so I could just double click it to open it up. Or what I can do is just dump it in there like that, and it opens up. I'm going to open up R. And it's not the version of R that I want. Hold on. Okay. 
Okay, so I can just highlight some code, come up here to where it says R send, and there's my codes transfer automatically into R. That's it. Now, in addition to the syntax highlighting that I mentioned before in terms of you have the freedom to do it however you want, another thing I like about 10R is that notice that this is a completely separate window <laughs> from my editor itself. And so if you work in a multiple uh, monitor environment, like I do, I have three monitors I use on my desk, I can put my 10R in one, one monitor, I can put my R console in another, and I can see a lot of what's going on because I have the whole monitor to myself. Now, there's a lot of other little quirks, I guess you could say, to, to using 10R and to get it into a what I think of as, as, as a better form. And I've outlaid those here in the notes if you're interested in using 10R. Uh, do note that for these computers here, this interface between 10R and R does not work. The ITS people, Information Technology Services people, have never been able to get to work on these computers. So when we do the final exam, and you're going to be taking that again using these computers, just note that this interface doesn't work. But what you can do is just simply highlight Control C for copy, and then Control V to paste. Okay, it's very simple. Okay, let's see. So in the notes, I give an address for where you can download this from. Um, do note that uh, due to quirks, also, sometimes I use that word today, and I don't usually use it very often. <laughs> um, due to quirks in how LaTeX and Lux um, uh, deals with um, uh, uh, URLs or web addresses, uh, in the notes, it's actually cut off on the side, the full web address to <coughs> download. Obviously, if you do a Google search for 10R, you're going to come across it. Or you can look at the video and come to that particular address right there to download it. Um, 10R has just put out a new version uh, in mid-October that I have not really tried out yet, version 5 something. I was using version 3 uh, just a minute or two ago. Okay. So let's talk about, let's go to page 18. We're going to talk about using 10R, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, using RStudio. Okay. So RStudio uh, first came out, first, uh, first, the first release to the public came out in early 2011. And it has quickly become um, the most used pro program editor out there. I think for those of us who were using R before 2011, you know, we started coming up, we, we, we found a programming editor that we liked and we've stuck with it. But since the number of users of R has just dramatically increased over time, you can imagine that a lot of the new users then end up migrating to R Studio, and that's why it's become uh, very popular. Now, the actual formal name for the software package, the programming editor, is called R Studio Desktop. It's made by a company called R Studio. People just simply call the editor R Studio. Um, and R, R Studio has done a lot for uh, forwarding, um, forwarding R in terms of making it more user friendly. Um, making it, uh, uh, giving a, no, a number of uh, additions uh, to it as well. Uh, some of the most well-known people uh, in statistics right now, uh, at least two of them I can think of, uh, actually work for our studio. Um, and interesting, just today, so so the version of our studio uh, that's uh, been out there is, uh, has been over time for the last five six years. 0 0.9 something. So whenever you see a zero as a version number, what does that mean? A beta release, you know, a test release. 
And just today, just today, there's been a, 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 an interesting thing that has happened in the history of at least our studio and maybe even statistics itself. Version 1.0 has finally been released. So that's interesting. Um, so this is what our studio looks like. Basically, everything, the console, the program editor, and you'll see some other stuff shortly, is all within inside one window itself. And that's actually one reason why I don't like our studio. Because <laughs> everything's within one side one window. So if you have a multiple monitor environment, things can get kind of small in terms of being able to how much you can see of your program, how much you can see of your console. So you can see at the bottom here, here's my console. Up top here, I have my, ed my editor. So I can do, let's say, x gets 2 plus 2. We're going to print off x. I can highlight it. And just similar to 10R, there's a button that you can push that's going to transfer the code to the editor. I'm sorry, uh, to the console. And so that's how it works. Here's the uh, program that we had seen in 10R. It has, as you can see, syntax highlighting in our studio, just like 10R does. But I don't think the syntax highlight is nowhere near as good as it should be. Um, the, the number of colors available is very small, and you have absolutely no control over it, what the colors are. Now, one thing that you will notice over here on the, on the right-hand side here is after I executed that code, look what it said. X Four. Well, look what I did in the console window. I created an object called X. And so over here, you'll see a list of all the objects that you've created, which can be helpful. And in fact, if, as we'll see later today, if you have like a big data set, or some kind of data set, uh, you'll see the data set up here and there, and you can simply click on it to open it up. Now, in the bottom right-hand side here, you see something called plots. Well, Graphs that you create will appear here. Also, here's all the packages that are installed. Here's a, a, a quick link to all the help. So it's all contained in one. And especially if you're new to using R, I think you can see why some people would prefer this. Because everything is there. I don't, I don't prefer it. But most of my students end up using this. Um, it's up to you whatever you want to use. Our studio is on these computers here. Okay. There's some other stuff that I say about our studio in here. Please take a look at this on your own. There are a number of editors, other editors out there. I don't think as much as there used to be because of, of the dominance of our studio. Uh, two in particular. Uh, that are worth noting is WinEdit. You might remember me mentioning WinEdit for editing LaTeX documents. Well, WinEdit can also be used uh, with R in much the same way that TinR can be used. You can even edit LaTeX documents in TinR too. Uh, for those of you who are Linux users, you might have heard of an editor called Emacs. Uh, this is a very popular editor uh, that people use with R with the Emacs Speech Statistics add-on with it. And lastly, you know, might also remember me talking about Revolution Analytics. Remember how they have like a, a version of R that you can purchase? Well, that version of R is actually free for students. So you can actually um, download it from their website and, um, and install it and use it. And basically it's just going to be like RR with some extensions to it that, you know, we wouldn't use in our class. Uh, also, with Microsoft's purchase of, of, um, of Revolution Analytics, uh, Microsoft now has in, in, embedded uh, or made available R to be used with their Visual, uh, Vi Visual Studio uh, software package. Okay, that can, concludes that section. Are there any questions? Okay, let's go to the next section. Regression basics. What this basically this section is going to allow us to do is further our understanding of the basics of R and how certain things are structured within R 
And to help do this, I'm going to put in the context of a regression example, specifically the high school and college GPA example that we've looked at earlier with respect to SAS. You know, whenever possible in this class, uh, what I have, what I'm trying to do, now that we've gone to our section, is I'm going to try to do a lot of the same things that we did with SAS in R, so that you can make a judgment on your own, which may be your preferred um, uh, way to uh, do statistics. So the first thing that we need to do is to be able to read in a data set, uh, read in a data set into R. So we need to get that GPA data set into R. And the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at this plain ASCII text file. Um, everything's space delimited. That first line there contains the variable names. So how can we get this into R? And let me reopen my program again. Okay, so this gpa.r program contains all the stuff that we're going to do in this new section. Again, at the top, you're going to see some comments. Again, every, any line that starts with a pound sign is a comment. I can even put comments at the end of lines as well. It doesn't matter. It just has to begin with, with a, a, a pound sign. And you know, at the top of every program, it's good to say, well, what does this program do? Who's the author? And all that good stuff. Um, as you see here, notes. Uh, I first put this program together, or at least the first draft of it, when I was doing a, an R workshop for the Gallup organization. Um, and so what I've done, I try to do is then organize my uh, program into main sections, such as data management. We're going to do some plotting and so on. You don't need to have all these pound signs there. I just do that just to help differentiate it from the rest of the text. And it looks so pretty. Anyway, so the first thing I need to do is read in the data set. And the function to do that in R, or one of them, is called read.table. So I'm reading basically a table of information. And I need to specify, well, where is that data file located where this table is included? Well, I say for my first argument, file, equal, and then I give the actual physical location on my hard drive of where it's located. So it's in the data folder. The file is called gpa.txt. Now you might be wondering, well, wait a second. Why do you have a double backslash there? Did you accidentally hold down the key too long on your computer? No. This is something that you have to do in R. Use a double backslash or you can use a single forward slash. Well, why do you have to use double backslash? Well, it all has to do with Linux. A, a one slash in Linux has a, has a, has a particular meaning. Well, that's an important for us to get into here. So that's why a double backslash is needed to separate out the folders and the files when you actually give the physical location. Then, header equal true. Remember how at the very first line of my file, I had the variable names? Um, that's what header equal true means. And the SEP stands for separator. How am I separating the columns of data? I'm using a space delimiter here. And so I put, in quotes, a space. Well, it just so happens that R recognizes if you just do quote, quote, without anything in there, it, it, it means space delimited. Okay? So either will work fine. Then, notice I have a less than dash there. Does anyone remember how to verbalize that in, in R speak? Gets. Gets, yeah, G-E-T-S. So I am putting all the information that results from read.table into an object which I decided to call GPA. Again, I could have called it something else, but it seems like a logical name. So I'm going to highlight that code, come up here to my corresponding button that will send the selection to R, and it goes in there. Let me make this bigger. And there we go. Okay. Now how do I know if I have read in the data correctly? Nope. Just type 
the name of the object. And there you go. Yes, it looks correct. It matches what was in the file. Good. I feel, I feel confident that this all worked. What happens if you have a large data set? Well, you don't want to print it all. You know, if you have thousands and thousands of observations, you don't want to print them all. So a very handy tool is to use a function called head. Head parentheses GPA in parentheses. And by default, it prints the first six observations. That will be a, a, a quick way that you can verify the data is correctly. If, let's say, you only want two observations, then include the corresponding argument n for the number of observations you put, say, n equal to. So why is the why is the head used? Well, you know, it's like the head of the file, you could say. And also, in Linux, there is a head function that you can use to see the first few lines of a file. That's why that name comes about. There also happens to be a function called g uh, tail in R that allows you to see the end of it. <coughs> Well, what happens if I had a comma delimited file? Well, if this gp.txt was comma delimited, as you might expect, for the SEP, I could just put in a comma there. Or, alternatively, I can use the function read.csv for a comma separated value. And all the arguments there are set up to something that you would typically want. Um, so the only argument that I need is the file name. And so if I just, head, I just highlight that and run it, you can see I've run in my data set again. And that was for a comma delimited file that I had available to us. Well, what about reading in Excel files? Well, just don't do it. <laughs> it's, it's more of a, it causes more problems than what it's worth. If you have an Excel file that has your data, just export it out as a comma delimited file and read it in. Um, things just got uh, uh, to be a pain when you had 32-bit versus 64-bit versions of Excel, um, and also 32-bit versus 64-bit computers, and I think most of us just kind of gave up on it, on it a few years ago. Although there are some packages out there that will allow you to read in Excel files. I don't, I don't find it to be really useful. Let's say if you want to actually um, export data out of R, well, you can use write.table as a function or write.csv. And it does it pretty much what you expect. You can experiment on your own about uh, how to do that. Now, in my lecture notes, you will notice how I have everything nicely, beautifully colored. Now, did I go in there in my lecture notes and say, okay, I want read.table at red. I want file to be green. Did I do that? No. Rather, this, this coloring here this that you see here is done automatically for me. All my lecture notes are done in links. Again, you can download them to see them. And let's take a look at these lecture notes here. There you go. It's kind of small. It was large enough on my computer in my office when I was stepping through my lecture notes. Okay, so this is my Lex fi Lex file that was used to create these lecture notes. And if I come down to here, you see in this part right there, this is what uh, was used to uh, read in the data the first time, the, the ask, plain ASCII text file. This is an evil red text box, an ERT. So I'm actually using some LaTeX code inside of here to, see this right here, this part right there, to actually run R. And I briefly mentioned this before, I believe. There's a package in R called Knitter, K-N-I-T-R, that you can use with LaTeX to have, when you compile your LaTeX document, it will also run the R code that you put in there automatically. 
And so that's what's happening here. We will talk about how to do this on your own later this month. But I want to at least point this out to you now when you're at, if you take a look at my actual looks document while you see these evil red text boxes everywhere. Um, now this knit, knitter package then has a way for it to um, uh, match the syntax to certain colors. So that's why you see in my PDF files that, I, that have my lecture notes, why you see everything nicely um, colorized. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, well, let's say that I just want to work with a, a part of my data set. Maybe I just want to work with high school GPA alone. How can I just pull out all the high school GPAs from my data set that I have? Okay. First of all, so here's my GPA data set. In R's terminology, this is important, this is called a data frame. It's a frame of data. That's where the name comes from. So people t don't typically refer to it as a data set. I mean, it is a data set, yes. But R's terminology in terms of this object here, this is called a data frame. And you do need to know that terminology. To access a particular variable in this data frame, I use the following syntax. GPA, dollar sign, the variable of interest. And that prints off just that particular variable. So GPA dollar sign HS dot GPA is actually a vector of numbers. So we've talked about before that how this one means, okay, this is the first value of the vector. 16 represents that 1.98 is the 16th observation, or 16th value of that vector. Well, let's say you have a large data set, you have many, many variables, and you need to know what the names of all these variables are. Well, one way to get that is say names, parentheses, GPA. So names is a particular function, and it spits back out the actual variable names. Right now, that doesn't seem to be very important, but it will be later. Now, you can also access parts of this data set using a matrix-like structure. So if I do GPA left square bracket 1 comma 1 uh, right square bracket, I get the first observation, first variable. It was 3.04, just to verify that indeed. Yep, there it is right there. So if I wanted this 3.1 from college GPA, what do I do? Just replace that second one with a 2, and that's how I can access first row, second column. Suppose I do GPA 1, comma. What do you think that's going to do? Just the first observation. If I do a comma 1, what's that going to do? The first column. Okay. Suppose I do something like this. I haven't talked about what a colon is. Yeah, one through five. So basically that one colon five means one, two, as in T-O, five. And in fact, look what happens if I just do one colon five at a prompt. One, two, three, four, five. So notice how I can specify a particular row numbers, I could also have done the column numbers too. I can spe specify particular row numbers uh, to extract. Now if I wanted to as well, I could create an object called X and maybe I could just put in there the first five observations. Okay, so there's X. Also, I could do something like this. I could combine together, let's say, row 1, 
in row 10, and let's, let's do all the columns. So again, remember that C function, which means concatenate. I'm putting together one, the number 1 and 10, and I'm just going to use that then to pick off particular rows of my data set. Again, you could use that with columns too. So, you have a very nice way to basically use a matrix-like uh, structure to extract stuff from a, uh, from a data frame. Here's another way you can uh, extract information. Um, let's say that I just want to print off the high school GPA variable again. You can use this syntax. GPA, I want all the rows, and then I just want the high school GPA column. That's another way to do it. You don't see as many people use that, uh, but it, it is possible. And I'm going to repeat myself here because I just want to make sure that this is clear based upon past experiences that I've um, had with teaching this. <coughs> Again, if I want to, I can put all the information that I just extracted, where I printed it automatically to the screen. Instead, I can put it into an object. So, you know, I can say save gets the results from that, and now saves all my high school GPAs. So even though I'm just mainly printing it to the screen, I can save these results into a new object. So here's a question for you. <coughs> what do you think that's going to do? Syntax error? Excuse me? Drop the second part. Well, basically, everything but that second column. And you know, it's not that interesting here because there's only one other column. But if there was five columns, it would just simply drop that second column. So that can be helpful at times. Now, there, there's going to be times where you need to access part of a data frame subject to a particular condition. So this is on page six now. So to do that, let's take a look at what happens when I execute this code. GPA dollar sign HS GPA less than 2.5. What this is going to do is do a logical comparison. Now there are 20 different high school GPAs. There's only one 2.5. I mean, on the right-hand side, 2.5 is 2.5. And so what the way that R reacts here is, again, it, it, it really operates nicely on vectors of information. And so what it's going to do is do that comparison for every single element in that high school GPA. And so, for example, the second value or second observation that data set does have a GPA of less than 2.5. And in fact, oops. I guess that is it right there. We can see that it's 2.35. And so we see some falses and trues. Okay. How about we can combine these trues and falses then with our data set? Oops. So I'm going to say... I'm going to put a whole bunch of trues and falses in there for the rows. And so what R is going to return to me is just those rows that have a true. That is basically the equivalent of in SAS when you do a data step, and maybe you do like an if-then. Here you just have this simple code here. Um, that's how you extract things from a, a data frame. It, by using this kind of a syntax of, I know how to find some trues and falses, and then R recognizes that when you combine it with, with the data set, I just want those rows. Or you equivalently can also do, I just want those columns by those trues and falses. Now you can make this more complicated too. I'm just going to go to my lecture notes to show you this.
Oh, I'm sorry. There's one other thing I wanted to, to do before I do the lecture notes. So, so we have all these trues and falses. But what happens if I did something like this? I'm going to sum. Sum is a function that sums up numbers. I'm going to sum up all those trues and falses. You might, might, might be thinking, well, wait a second. You can't do that. Tr a true is a word. False is a word. Well, yes, you can do that. R treats trues as ones. Falses as zeros. So when I go like that, I get six. There are six observations that fit this criteria. Okay. Now, sometimes you might have more complicated conditions to work with with your data set. Maybe you want to know what high school GPAs are less than 2.5, and those, for those same people, which ones had college GPAs less than 2.5. So you can combine conditions together with an AND, or an R syntax will be an ampersand. So <coughs> again, you get back trues and falses, then that satisfied both conditions. To do an OR, use a vertical line. Now you have those cases that satisfy at least one of those conditions. What about checking, is any high school GPA equal to, let's say, 2.35? Well, you can do that. We actually saw some examples of that a little bit last time where, if you remember, we did 1 equal equal... 2, we get a false. 2 equal equal 2, we get a true. Well, the way that, again, R handles this by working with vectors of information, it will check every single observation. Is it equal to 2.35 or not? And it just happens to be 1 in this data set. You could turn things around, and you, say, and you might be thinking, well, how do I do a not equal? That's where an exclamation mark equal means not equal. <coughs> okay, are there any questions? <coughs> now, you know, there are, there is a function in R that um, uh, can do some of these, these, um, um, these kinds of logical comparisons as well. It's called an if-else function, as you might, might imagine. It works very similarly to how if-else works um, yeah, I think it, it's what the, func or the if function in Excel, for example, how that works. Um, I have examples in my program. Uh, we will look in more detail about how, how if else works later in this semester. Okay. So there's a, a nice function R called summary. Summary allows you to summarize information in a data frame. So I can say summary, the first argument is called object. So summary object equal, let's say I want to summarize information that's in GPA. And what I have here is just a nice numerical summary as well. Now, later in these notes, you're going to see me use summary as well. But you're going to get a lot different result coming back. And that's going to be important. You'll see more about that later on. So lastly, before we stop here, let's talk about plotting. So simply, to do a very basic plot, use the plot function. What's on my x-axis? We'll use the x argument to determine that. I put in the high school GPAs. For my y-axis, I put in the college GPAs. <coughs> so if I highlight that and run it, look what happens. A new window pops up. And now I have my nice little plot. We can do a lot better, though, for a plot. Let's make it look fancy. So not only am I going to use the x and the y arguments, but how about an x lab argument, which is going to be x-axis label? How about we do a y-axis label? A main plot title. I'm going to specify my x limits to be between 0 and 4.5. My y-axis limits is 0 to 4.5. Now let's do red points. After all, this is the plotting points, that is. This is Nebraska, so let's, let's do red. 
PCH. What do you think PCH stands for? Pacific Coast Highway. Plotting character. I'm going to use the first plotting character. Next time I'll show you the list of all the plotting characters out there. CEX corresponds to, well, how big do you want these plotting characters to be? And it's a, it's a relative scale. 1.0 is the default. If I do 1.5, it's going to be 50% larger than the default. 0.5 is going to be 50% smaller than the default. What do you think LWD stands for? Line width. And what this is going to correspond to is how thick are the lines that are used in the plotting points? And this is going to be twice the default. Panel dot first corresponds to, well, what do you want first plotted there before you plot any points at all? I want some grid lines. I want them to be in gray. That's the color. And LTY, what do you think that stands for? Line, line type. I want dotted. I'll show you all the line types later. And if I highlight that code, run it, go to my graphics window, and now that plot looks a little bit better. Very simple, um, it's very simple to do plots and all. Are there any questions? Okay, so let's uh, talk about the assignment from last time, or that, I, that you've all received back since we last met. Okay, so problem number one, what I decided to do to grade this was I took 18 of those 20 points and I divided it up into six different categories that were uh, given three points apiece. So for example, <coughs> we have, oh, I'm not going to write all these out, I'll just write the first one, numbered lists. Did you do, did you work with numbered lists correctly in the assignment? So if you did, get three points. If there was some problem, you got maybe two or less. Also, uh, uh, the courier-like font for the SAS code and output that's outside of uh, program listing boxes. Do you do proper indenting? So that's the third one. Fourth was equations. Fifth was uh, graphics or images. Were they properly inserted? And six was, the, did you handle the listings boxes correctly? So that left two more points left over. And basically, I, I just use those two points to make deductions of, uh, you know, was if there was a misspelled word, if there was, let's say, duplicate words, like you put maybe the, the, back, uh, back to back. Um, well, th those kinds of, of, of issues, if those were all handled correctly, you got those two points. Now, the, the common errors that I saw dealt with that listings package in terms of not getting the font correct or not maybe using the easiest way to get the font correct. I mean, if you, if you got the font correct, I, I still gave you credit even if you did it a different way than what I would do. Um, but to get that font correct, I needed to come up here to document settings and uh, use a, a particular set of, of listings options, which were talked about in, in the lecture notes. Uh, so that TT family there is what gave you that basically that courier-like font. Um, sometimes I, I found some students having difficulties with some of the equations and getting them right. Like whenever you put a hat on top of a sigma, Find it. It needs to just be on top of the sigma, not also be on top of the square there. Um, so those were the, the main things that I saw. It was just small, small issues. Uh, number two, I don't have any specific comments about that, um, other than maybe what I, I wrote in your own documents that I handed back to you. Problem number three. Okay. With problem number three, one issue that I saw. No, let's just compile it. I guess that's problem number four. 
Well, even though that's a problem number four, we can still talk about it. <coughs> okay, so if you see where my mouse is, notice how I use big parentheses here. The reason being is because everything that you see between those two parentheses needs to be actually inside the parentheses itself. If instead you would have done a, uh, something like this, I'll have to draw it out. Well, that doesn't look right. You know, those parentheses are not actually encompassing the entire equation. Whenever you have an equation, you work with parentheses or brackets or whatever, you always need to put, if it's inside of it, that parentheses needs to cover everything. Um, and then sometimes um, uh, some students were, were forgetting to have spaces between equations and words. So if you have an equation, you need to put a space after it. You don't just immediately start the next word. Um, and I, I see that, that issue pop up uh, in, in other, other settings, too. I'm not, not sure why. Um, so then problem number four, this was the Beamer presentation. You know, I, I try not to take off points that in number three that, that maybe you missed. I try not to carry those, or I did not try to take off, I, I did not take off points again for the same mistakes that would have been in, in, in problem number four. Um, and, and just lastly, you know, a helpful hint when it comes to doing uh, presentations is don't use complete sentences for your bullets. They're basically meant to be phrases. Don't, you, don't, you don't have to use complete sentences. You don't need to end a, um, a, 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 a bullet with, with a period. Although, as I was preparing here for today's class, Notice here I have that period right there. So, you know, on my course evaluations, make sure you put there that uh, Chris puts periods at the end of his, his bullets. Uh, but they're supposed to be just phrases. And you need to keep them um, simple. Try to avoid having long, complete sentences that carry over through multiple lines. You know, I always try to have all my bullets just basically be one line. Sometimes you, don't need, you need to have it more than one line. Uh, but definitely I, I avoid three or four lines. You know, this is not like you're writing a paper or a report. This is meant for a presentation. And that, that wording that you would do in a paper or report in terms of complete sentences, that's what you're giving verbally during the presentation. You're not doing that with your slides that you would have. Okay. Are there any questions? Let's talk about the next assignment then. Okay, so this assignment was um, written in links. So on my website, you will have a PDF file, uh, I'm sorry, not PDF, a zip file that you can download if you have it already. Um, inside the zip file, there's the PDF that was created from the Lix file. And also there's one small image that I had in my Lix file, so that's why you will see an images folder. Um, so this, this assignment's in a, a similar context to what you've done before. In fact, you're working with basically a lot of the, the, you're working with the same data sets that you did for assignment number one. Um, and you're trying to actually duplicate some of the stuff that you did in assignment number one and maybe a little bit over into assignment number two. You're trying to duplicate that stuff that was done in SAS now in R. Um, but as you can imagine, since it's a different software package, package there's going to be some stuff that it has to be different. Um, and so when you do your assignment, what I recommend that you do is you take my Lix file and you simply put your answers in that Lix file and then you hand in your Lix file corresponding PDF that you get from it, and then also any kind of uh, graphics that you include in your assignment as well. Put this all together in one nice organized zip file. That's what you need to email me. Is that clear? Any questions? Yes? So if you have like R code, do you like put it in program listings? Or? Exactly. I want you to use a program listings for this. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. So similar to what you did with the SAS, do that here now with R. Now again, my lecture notes are not done in program listings. 
they're done with, with the knitter package. Um, so, you know, the next assignment, you will have experience with that knitter package. And that is the um, typically the preferred way to do something like this. Uh, but for now, since we can't talk about the knitter package because we haven't done much with uh, R yet, that's why use the listings uh, boxes to put all your R code in there, similar to what the SAS was done. Yes. So you have to have the fully applied and the intended. Yes. It needs to look nice. It needs to look professional. Everything needs to be lined up nicely. Um, I do recommend, and I don't, I don't remember if I, if I mentioned this in, in any graded assignments, there were some students who were uh, doing indenting with using tabs inside the program listings boxes. And what that caused was a huge shift of the code. You know, let's say if you, in SAS, you know, maybe you had PROC and the SG pot. And then, um, I forget what the exact command is. Then you have, and then you had a tab here. And that caused a huge shift of the code over. I mean, so much that it just, it just doesn't look uh, professional. What I recommend that you do instead of a, a tab, just use a space. One or, I use two spaces typically, as you'll notice in my answer key. You just need to indent it a little bit. You don't need to indent it like what would be the equivalent of 10 to 15 spaces. Any other questions about format? Okay. Feel free to ask questions in the future about the format. So problem number one, so it's a continuation of problem number one from assignment number one. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, part A, read the data into R using read.csv, which we did earlier today. And print the first five observations using the head function. So what's the key argument that you're going to use with that head function to get only five observations? N, N equals five, yeah. The next problem, we haven't talked about the levels yet, so I'm going to skip over it. Uh, part C, print only the names of each offensive lineman with their 40-yard dash times. So you're going to think about, well, how can I only print certain, certain people? And again, that kind of corresponds to some of the stuff that we were doing earlier today. Then... Find the 40-yard, I'm sorry, find the mean 40-yard dash times for the players by each position. So if you remember with that, that data set, there was a number of different positions. For each position, I want to know what the mean is. There's a few different ways you can do that. One, use the mean function. We talked about the mean function last time. Um, and, and now today we talked about, well, how can I only get maybe certain players in this case how can I extract maybe just certain players from that data set so I can find just the means for, let's say, the quarterbacks? Yes? Do you have to do something special with letters over numbers in your, like, for exam or like, position equals OL? Do you need quotes around that or anything? Uh, yes, you would need quotes around the OL. Uh, and also you would need a double equal. Yep. Yep. Um, I think both will work. I guess I always use double quotes. And then, a little bit more easier way to do this is to use the aggregate function, which we have not talked about today. So this is one of those cases where, okay, look at the help for this. And it will actually make it quite simple. Um, now, for part E here, I want you just to focus on offensive linemen and wide receivers. Find the standard deviation for each with respect to their 40-yard dash times. Also find their sample sizes. And as you might guess, where are we going with this? Well, now you're going to do a t-test to compare the mean population mean times for these two players. And so what I want you to do is actually program in the corresponding t-test statistic equation, program in the corresponding way to get a p-value, similar to what you did with SAS, but now you're doing it with R to do this hypothesis test with the difference of two means. Part G, well, guess what? You can actually do this test a lot more simple 
or more simply, by using the t.test function, which we actually looked at a little bit last time, but you're going to have to use it a different way than what we did, because we only had like a one sample population mean confidence interval. Here we have a two sample problem, and we're interested in the hypothesis test. So again, you're going to need to uh, go to the help. So the first part here, go to the help. Prove to me that you went to the help by inserting a screen capture. Then use t.test to actually perform the test. This third part here, the corresponding material for that will be covered, I think, in our next class. It gets into some of the ways that are a structure that are extremely important for you to understand and to get out of this class. Because if you understand that, that will go a long way to understanding how to use R in, in its fullest extent. Then problem number two, well, this is a continuation of problem number two from assignment number one. Okay, this time I want you to enter the data directly into your program and save it as a data frame. So what function do you think might be useful in this particular case? How, how did we enter data then for that, when we did a confidence interval for one mean? What function did we use? One letter. The C function. Okay. Now, what I have not shown you yet is that there's a function called data.frame. And what you'll see uh, through our, some of our stuff coming up is that we can use that data.frame function then to put these vectors of information then into one data set, data frame. Then part B, you're going to actually estimate a regression model to this data. We'll learn how to estimate a regression model next time using the LM function. Part C, now you're going to do some of those plots of potency versus time. So similar to what we just did here for a scatter plot. In part D, now you're going to put some confidence interval bands on that plot. And you'll see how to do that next time as well. So pretty much after next time, or depending upon how, how far we get my action going to next Tuesday, uh, you'll be set to go on this assignment. And again, in case I didn't say this already, the assignment is due 11-11 uh, at noon. Maybe I shouldn't make it 11 a.m. Do you want to do 11 a.m.? <laughs> so, November 11th at noon. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Yes? Yeah. I think what you're saying is, because this is also an assessment of your ability to use Lix properly, too. And I, I kind of debated about how to do that. I thought about actually, you know, having just a, a plain old a problem that was worth maybe like 10 points where, uh, you know, if you do everything correctly in licks, you get all those 10 points. If you don't, um, you you lose some points. What I decided to do alternatively was I will take off points just in the regular context of the actual problem itself. So let's say problem 1A, you don't do something right with licks. Okay, well, and then you're going to lose some of the, some of the corresponding points. Are there any questions? Any other questions? Okay, then that's it for today.